All right, so uh, we're moving on here in Gravity's Rainbow, uh, and we're approaching uh, the midpoint of the book almost exactly here. The exact midpoint is page 385. Here we're 334 down to 365, but I think Pynchon uh, treats this as the symbolic midpoint of the book because uh, this is so. This is the noon of the book, and this the next chapter, the one on Chicherin, uh, takes place on June 21st. Uh, and the solstice is, of course, the noon of the year. Uh, and here in this chapter, we have the ascent motif, like the ascent of the sun during the year to its apogee at solstice. Uh, so this is episode four of part three, which takes place on May 28th uh, in 1945. Um, and in this chapter, it begins with uh, Slothrip back with Gelly tripping now. Um, and they have ascended the Brocken. So they're on the top of the Brocken just before dawn, uh, watching the sun rise. And as it rises, uh, Pynchon describes it as a kind of rainbow effect. So we get the rainbow motif again. Um, and I just want to draw your attention to the fact that in, in a sense, we've already seen that the Brocken links back to Faust with the Valpurgis knocked, and then the ascent up the Brocken and the perceiving of a rainbow matches the opening of Faust part two, uh, act one, right at the beginning where Faust finds himself on top of a mountain. It isn't the Brocken, but he's on top of a mountain uh, and he sees a rainbow glittering through uh, a waterfall, a cataract. So I'll read that passage. So sun and back, my eye too weak to scan it, I rather follow, with entrancement growing, the cataract that cleaves the jagged granite from fall to fall, in thousand leaps out throwing, a score of thousand streams in its revolving, from upflung foam a soaring lacework blowing. But in what splendor from this storm evolving vaults up the shimmering arc in variance lasting. Now purely limed and now in air dissolving, a cooling fragrance all about it casting. This mirrors all aspiring human action. On this your mind, for clear insight fastened, that life is ours by colorful refraction. So this, uh, Goethe has this idea here that um, the function of art, in a way, is to step down as a transformer the divine radiance, like the sun, uh, like the way the rainbow sort of steps down the blinding radiance of the sun. So art steps down the blinding radiance of the spiritual world uh, and transforms it into the refractory rainbow of the world's iridescent colors. And this is the job of art, to translate the spiritual world uh, into something we can bear, as it were, so we don't have to stare directly at the sun. Um, and um, so we do have that reference here with Pynchon. We also have, uh, with him on the top of the Brocken, we also have the reference to the witch, and one thing I forgot, about the Wizard of Oz reference at the beginning of this section, we saw the, the reference to the, the, the Tin Man as Chittering and the Lion uh, with, with Leo here, and then it also contained a reference to the witch. And here we have Gelly Tripping as a, as a witch. So I, I'd forgotten about that. Uh, we have in the Wizard of Oz the Wicked Witch of the East and the Wicked Witch of the West. Gelly Tripping is more the Witch of the East because she's standing here at dawn and they're watching the sun rise out of the East. And also the fact that, and Pynchon refers to this in the second paragraph here, that in his own family, William Slothrop in the 17th century was the first to preside over a witch trial in America that conferred capital punishment on a witch. So, so this woman was put to death uh, under William Slothrop, who was serving on, on, on the court at the time. Uh, so Pynchon has this in his ancestry and indeed, uh, part of the New England consciousness structure always contains this relation to the witch hunts in its, in its consciousness structure from Nathaniel Hawthorne all the way down through H.P. Lovecraft. And it's no accident that horror fiction was more or less born out of New England uh, down to H.P. Lovecraft and then ultimately to Stephen King and of course here also uh, Thomas Pynchon. Um, he's always aware and conscious of his ancestry and the blood guilt that his family is stained with Slothrop is basically Pynchon's alter ego here, in the same way that Stephen Dedalus is Joyce's alter ego in The Artist as a Young Man in Ulysses. Um, so he has this reference, and then um, and then they, uh, they're flirting a bit, and I believe they have sex, although Pynchon's not real clear about it, on the top of the brock and after the sun rises, and then she has an idea. He, uh, he's Now he's in flight once again from someone. Before he was trying to evade pointsmen, uh, and the, the white visitation, uh, and now he still has to evade uh, General, um, or is it Major, Major Marvy? Uh, so Marvy is still in pursuit, and he's worried about it. 
she says, well, uh, I know a guy named Schnorp who has a hot air balloon uh, over the ridge here who could take you to Berlin. He's like, I don't want to go to Berlin. And she's like, you want to go anywhere that Major Marvy isn't. And he's like, good point. <laughs> so they go uh, and sneak, seek out this guy, Schnorp, uh, who has a hot air balloon in his backyard. Gelly waves his goodbye. And uh, he gets into the balloon with Schnorp. And Schnorp has, uh, Schnorp is transporting some custard, a stack of about a dozen custard pies that he intends to sell on the black market in Berlin. Uh, so they go up into the air and... Um, they're soaring, and of course, this is again. We're, we're at the noon of the novel here. We have the ascent to the Brocken, at the, which is the tallest of the Hartz Mountains, and then we have the ascent into the air with the hot air balloon. So this is the apogee, the noon of the novel, and uh, of course, Pynchon is also doing an archaeology on the history of space flight, which begins with hot air balloons in the 18th century, the latter part of the 18th century. Um, the hot air balloon was the first thing that got us up off the ground and put us into the air, and so Pynchon wants you to think of that. Also, it links with uh, the opening of uh, his novel Against the Day, which starts with a hot air balloon that deliberately actually quotes from Jules Verne's 1863 science fiction novel Five Weeks in a Balloon, uh, which is one of his first novels, and um, so, which is the sort of birth of science fiction. Uh, Jules Verne is the source. Poe really invented it, and Mary Shelley with Frankenstein, of course. Um, but Poe in the 1830s really invented the genre. And last time uh, we talked about Chicherine's archaeology as a cyborg going back to the man who was used up in 1839. Uh, that was one of Poe's first science fiction stories, and indeed one of the first science fiction stories. And um, so they're off and running. And uh, uh, and then Ma Major Marvy does indeed show up in the form of an airplane. Uh, and uh, Slothrop notices this, and he's pointing it out to Schnorp. Uh, they're, they're gorging themselves on, on pie. Uh, and then as Marvy comes by, uh, I guess he's got his cockpit open or whatever, and uh, Slather pearls a custard pie at him. It gets all over his face. Uh, and of course, it's pension. You have to have a pie throwing fight in a, in a pension novel. That goes without saying. And uh, then they keep throwing, uh, and the guys in the uh, in, in the plane, the, uh, it's a larger plane than a, than a single uh, pilot, um, are singing the the dirty limer limericks again. Uh, in Prussia, they never eat pussy. And <laughs> the refrain keeps going uh, as this plane goes comically past them. It reminds me of uh, one of the scenes in Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade there with the Hindenburg-type blimp and the, and the guy, the Nazi plane going past it. Uh, and they keep throwing pies, this arsenal of pies at the plane, and finally they get its engine all gunked up and it just stops and cuts out. And they ditch it in a cloud and, and leave. Uh, and that's pretty much the end of this chapter. So Pynchon's on his way to Berlin. Uh, so now episode five actually does take place on the solstice. It's June, it's set June 21st, um, which is right on the solstice. And now we shift over to Russia and the story of Chicherin and his background. And now, so previously now we have seen, uh, Pynchon has discussed uh, Teutonic mythology uh, in the that passage on uh, Mittelwerke and then the Hereros after that. Uh, Southwest uh, African mythologies. And in this chapter, uh, now he shifts over to Russia and the Russian world, although he doesn't discuss the mythology much because uh, Chicherin is, a, is an anarchist and a nihilist, as he says. And, and of course, Russian communism is based on wiping that kind of stuff out. It's regarded as nonsense. Uh, too bad for the Russians. That, that's a huge mistake. Um, and so so now, yeah, so Titrine is the Tin Man from Wizard of Oz again, as we had Gelly Tripping as the witch, um, these kinds of illusions. And then Chitrine, uh starts out, he's thinking about uh, how much he wants to kill his half-brother, Enzian, uh, and the Schwartz Commando. And, and Pinson says, he comes from Nihilist stock, after all, uh, as though the only reason that he wants to wipe out the Schwartz Commando is simply because he's a Nihilist, a Russian communist Nihilist, and they like to wipe shit out just for the fun of it, I guess. Um, it's always a mistake when you do that. And then, uh, so now what he's doing, uh, so his, the, the backstory on Chicherin is that um, he's working for the Soviet state as a guy uh, going out into the, the countryside in Kyrgyzstan, uh, dealing with the Kyrgyz peasants and introducing a new alphabet to them, what's called the, the New Turkic Alphabet which is a, a sort of Latinized way of writing the alphabet 
uh, to replace the uh, Arabicized form of writing the alphabet. So that's what he and his companion, Jakip uh, Kulan, Jakip means Jacob, uh, Kulan means horse, um, and they're riding horses through the countryside as they do this, are going from village to village, introducing them to the alphabet, and they're also writing down songs, uh, just like Albert B. Lord does uh, in The Singer of Tales, when he's talking about going through Greece, learning the traditions of orality, and how oral consciousness is totally different from literate consciousness. Uh, and this is written about brilliantly, probably in the best book on the subject by Walter Ong, Orality and Literacy, which comes out of the McLuhan Media Studies uh, School. But that also puts Chicharine in the role of a kind of a Cadmus. We've already seen that on the one hand, he's a kind of cyborg. He's got uh, metal teeth. He's got a silver plate under his pompadour. And he's got some circuitry uh, as a kind of three-dimensional tattoo on his knee. As Pynchon calls it, he had to have an operation on his knee. Um, so he's more metal than anything else, as Pynchon describes him, just like Darth Vader. Um, there's that, but he's also in the role of Cadmus. He's very literate, and he's going through the countryside introducing uh, this new alphabet, which puts him in the role of Cadmus, the, who uh, brings the alphabet to Greece from Phoenicia, uh, where it's sewn as the dragon's teeth. Uh, the analogy between the letters of the alphabet and teeth are interesting because there's about the same number of teeth in the mouth as there are in the alphabet. Number one and number two, the alphabet carves up and chews up the mythical consciousness structure, which always runs around in circles. The alphabet, for the first time, uh, it sort of deworlds itself purely phonetically from the, Im the image world of hier er Egyptian hieroglyphics, which is wh how it, that's the matrix from whence it came. We know that because the letter A, for instance, is an upside down bull's head. Uh, a lot of them, uh, as Mark Allen Wachneen shows in his wonderful book, The Mysteries of the Alphabet, a lot of these are just simply Egyptian hieroglyphs. And this, the alphabet was created by um, workers in the Sinai turquoise mines. Uh, and this is true, now we know this. And it goes all the way back to 2000 BC, who are scrolling it out on walls, almost like a kind of graffiti. Uh, so the Hebrews are more likely the progenitors of the alphabet than the Phoenicians, although they're two different scripts. Uh, the script in Phoenicia is the the Ugarit script, the, the Ugaritic script, which is a slightly different version of it than the Proto-Sinaitic uh, script. Either way, so Chitrine is in this role of a kind of Cadmus, uh, getting the populations to read, getting them to become literate. And of course, literacy comes with its own dangers, as Leonard Schlein writes about uh, in his book, The Alphabet Versus the Goddess. Uh, Schlein is mostly just kind of a, a goofball popularizer. I'm, I'm not particularly fond of him. Uh, and I met him in San Francisco, interacted with him a few times. He was a surgeon, uh, a laparoscopic surgeon who just wrote three books on art and physics and uh, Alphabet Versus the Goddess and uh, the book about sex, power, and time in his free time as a, a total dilettante. But nevertheless, uh, the point made in Alphabet versus the Goddess is interesting to chew on uh, because he makes this point that wherever uh, societies become literate, they become aggressive not too long after. Um, and here that's sort of what Pynchon implies in this chapter. They become very aggressive. Um, it shifts be because it shifts the hemispheres. Uh, he says, and I don't know whether this is tenable or not, I have my doubts about it, but he has this thesis that uh, goddess worshiping societies are usually non-literate. Uh, women fare better and they're less aggressive than societies which are literate. Uh, let's say you contrast Sparta with Athens in which uh, in Sparta the women were treated equally. Women were treated equally. Uh, they could work out in the nude along with everyone else and be soldiers along with everyone else. The Spartans weren't literate or cultured at all. They're pretty pretty bland. Uh, we worship Athens for a reason. That's where art and literature and culture in the Northern European West begins. Um, and uh, so he has this idea that, um, so writing is left hemispheric, which is wired to the right hand. And when cultures become literate, they shift to the left hemisphere, which is also the same hand in which the sword, is, uh, the weapon, it always is in the right hand. Um, and so these societies become aggressive. It's a bit trivial. This is kind of simplistic, but nonetheless, sometimes you have to wonder, um, once societies become literate, they do tend to become revolutionary and interested in nationalism and forming states and uh, all that may be connected with a shift of emphasis to the uh, left hemisphere. 
and the right hand, which is connected with it. So then we get Chicharin's story as he's going through the countryside, and we learn then also about the fact that um, he has been drug addicted. Um, he's a, in addition to, he pinched pairs him with a couple of uh, individuals. The first one, as we've seen, was his sidekick, uh, Ju Jacob uh, Kulan, and here the next one is Chu Peng, a Chinaman who was able to get him opium, and the two sit and smoke opium. And then he also met, uh, meets with a, uh, yet another representative from one of these corporations, a subsidiary of IG Farben. Uh, what is it? The, um, his name is Vimpa, which of course is meant to suggest wimp, uh, but he's German, so it would be Vimpa. Ostrasenakunda uh, GmbH, um, which is a subsidiary of IG Farben, who tells him about uh, all the different drugs that he's working on as a chemist uh, for analgesics in the quest to find an analgesic that does not cause addiction. But he says no such thing exists because the two go hand in hand. Once the, ner the central nervous system becomes uh, numbed by painkillers, it only ever wants more and more of them, which is true down to this day with the opioid crisis. So, um, so he's telling Chicharine about this. And Chicharine thinks he's a scumbag. Uh, because these doctors are profiting off of people's pain. And, he, and the guy just says, that's what doctors do. Isn't that their profession? Um, so maybe the two both have points. And then so um, then we learn the story of uh, Chicharin's father, um, who fought in the Russo-Japanese War, which uh, took place in 0405 uh, in the Pacific there. Um, yeah, and that war, by the way, was uh, the prelude to Japan in World War II, uh, because the Japanese were on a roll. Uh, in that, they won that war, and in Manchuria, uh, they just kept having victory after victory, a bit like the Nazis in their conquest of Europe, just one victory after the next. And here again, here's this, the thesis that um, industrialization in both cases, in the cases of the Germans and the Japanese, both of whom industrialized late, especially the Germans, uh, it seemed to make them unhinged. They went insane. Uh, and industrialization requires literacy. You can't do it without literacy. So maybe literacy and industrialization are connected. The Meiji Restoration, uh, which took place in the 1860s uh, in Japan, uh, was a, not really a restoration, it was a westernization. Uh, the samurai were made illegal from that point on. Factories came in and they copied the West, the West, the West. And then we started getting all their woodblock prints and that influenced Whistler and all that kind of stuff. And Oscar Wilde, Aubrey Beardsley, all, they're all gaining influences from this cross-fertilization uh, as the result of the Meiji Restoration uh, with Japan and the West. Uh, but then this leads to the madness of the Russo-Japanese War and then Manchuria, their victories in both cases over the Russians and the Chinese, and then onward uh, into World War II and their attempt to create an empire by just, hey, we're on a roll, let's conquer the entire Pacific. Same thing with the Nazis, hey, we're on a roll, Let's conquer uh, the West. Let's conquer Africa. Oh, let's try the Russians. <laughs> uh, whoops. <laughs> no, that, that's not going to happen. Uh, Russia has an infinite, infinite supply of people. No matter how many of them you kill, there's an infinite number more. It's like trying to get rid of an anti. It's not going to work. Uh, so, so Admiral, uh, so there's the voyage of this guy from the Baltic, Admiral, Raj Dostensky, if I can pronounce it, um, leaves from the Baltic and goes down around South Africa on his way to the war in the Pacific, uh, where Chicharin's father is a gunner on board this ship who will be killed in the, in the war. But on the way, they put in a, a port in Namibia. They stop there in Southwest Africa, where Chicharin's father, uh, Chicharin Sr., uh, meets a, a young Herero girl and uh, produces Chicharin from that uh, union. Uh, but also Enzian from a different woman. And so Chitrine and Enzian are half-brothers, and they both have it in for each other. Uh, it's like two particles that just want to collide and annihilate each other. Um, and so, so that's the story of his paternity. And uh, it's a very long chapter, very well written, and uh, then ends with them, him, back to him and uh, Jakob uh, Kulan going to a village where they're having a singing contest, kind of like De Meistersinger, Wagner's De Meistersinger, where the old uh, singers, the, the troubadour singers, the minnesingers, as they're called, 
uh, would have singing con contests going back and forth in here. In this local village, a boy and a girl are having a singing contest. So we get the oral structure that Walter Ong writes about, in orality and literacy. But then uh, Jacob uh, and uh, Chitrine are translating it into writing. They're listening to the song and they're writing it down with this new Turkish alphabet that they're trying to introduce in the countryside. So they're writing it down. And once they have the full song, uh, the Akin's song, I suppose the Akin uh, is the singer, if I'm even pronouncing that right, um, is the singer, the bard, the minnesinger, the troubadour type figure in this local Kyrgyz tradition. They get it and they leave as kind of as booty. And uh, so then that brings us up to date uh, almost to, to page 365. So we're 20 pages away from the exact half point of the novel.